Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today we have a Jack Aduo. Jack is a real estate syndicator with a thousand units across four states. He started investing in real estate over 10 years ago with single family properties and has since transitioned to multifamily real estate. So thanks so much for being on the show, Jack. Yeah, thank you. Thank you too. So what was your professional background prior to starting uh, real estate investing uh, 10, 12 years ago? So actually, so I've been in the IT industry, uh, like a lot of, you know, for some odd reason, a lot of people in the multifamily space, a lot of them always have some kind of IT background. So I have an IT background. I'm actually, st I still have my nine to five job. Uh, I've been in IT about over 15 years now, you know, it's been a good run, can't complain. Yes. And then why did you choose to get into real estate years ago? So, um, uh, so this is like about uh, around 2009, me and my wife, we just got married. Uh, I got a job with HP as a software developer uh, in Idaho. And so we moved to Boise, Idaho. And, you know, we moved from LA. So as you can imagine, moving from LA to Idaho, all of a sudden, you know, house, houses were like pennies on the dollar, you know. <laughs> so we bought our single family, our five of a primary home that is and uh you know uh after we bought it you know the, i remember clearly there was a house we wanted to buy and we had put an offer and they declined our offer and that's after we bought our primary home you know it came back on market and it came back even at a lower price than what we had originally put off and on and uh, with some money left over you know from the wedding and just savings and then we decided to invest that money into the, uh, to buy that single family. And I remember the price was about 80,000 and there was a tenant on it already paying about 900, 900. And so, you know, coming in, no experience, zero experience. I just saw that there was an opportunity to buy it because it was so cheap. And uh, if somebody can pay that much, you know, my, I think my uh, um, net profit was about, 400. I think mortgage was coming to about 500. And so I was like, holy smoke. From day one, the, uh, we bought it as a short sale. And the day we bought it, uh, I just went to the property and um, gave the tenant notice. Hey, I'm the new landlord. Uh, so please uh, send all the payment to me and everything. I did not even ask for a deposit, you know, because I was kind of landing on the road, landing on the go. So she just started sending me uh, money from next month and it was the best feeling ever all of a sudden you know I have this four hundred dollars coming to my account and I'm not having to do much and I was like holy smoke yeah I gotta invest more on this so around that time uh, we basically you know we don't know any other financing strategy how to acquire more property with different financing so the only thing we know was save and buy the next house, save and buy the next house. Uh, we didn't have any kids at that time, so it was pretty much, you know, uh, uh, trying to live a frugal life and save as much as we can and use that money to buy the next house. So basically every quarter, we were buying a house, you know, on average, every quarter buying a house. And after we bought more than 10, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, the time is, you get uh, Freddie May and Freddie out, so we couldn't get any more the sweet government back loan, so... And this like over five years ago. So oh, the financing market was still a little, um, how do you call it? The financing market was still, was still frozen or strict. So any lender that was going to give us a loan was basically going to give us a loan on their books. And they all started, you know, basically demanding for more um, money. They basically, I remember talking to one lender based in Idaho, one of those, those regional lenders. And the one the twelve month cash reserve for every single house we did, we had, we had, which means they were basically assuming that we can easily go twelve months straight 
with all the houses being empty and not a single person paying for, for rent. I mean, it was just crazy. Boise was still growing even through that time. Boise has always been growing, and it was like kind of ridiculous. In addition to that, they also required like 30% down payment, and um, uh, interest rate was well above, I think, uh, 200 basis points above the going rate at the time. So it was like, you know, uh, five something. And so I was like, oh, forget it. So I started looking into other ways to finance deal. And that's when I learned into multifamily that if you buy it bigger, then all of a sudden the financing strategy changes. So I started looking into multifamily. Yeah. So before going into multifamily, what were you doing with those properties? I know you were renting them out at the end. Were you flipping any of them? Uh, were you rehabbing any or were you buying these pretty much turnkey and then just renting them out for cash flow? I think that would make it very attractive. So this Idaho, so this is like early 2000, right? No, not early, but um, 2010s, right? So I would buy a house, I was built in 2005 and I bought it in 2014. So it's, it's literally less than 10 years old. It's basically a turnkey. So I'm a buy and hold. I've never sold any of my property. My goal was to buy a house because I mean, I have my job. So I'm, I'm my nine to five job. So I'm not trying to be a flipper. I mean, I can be a flipper, but it's just going to be another extra work in addition to my nine to five. So if I can get something and just buy and hold it and just let the cash flow and grow in equity, uh, I mean, I love it. So that's always been my goal. I've never sold any of my houses. I don't plan on selling them anytime soon. Because I believe they're just good cash cow and um, I can hold them forever. And you know, it's a generational wealth. You know, I can, you know, give them to my kids, you know, down the line. And so just, I've not had a, seen a need to sell them. So you, you mentioned financing was a determining factor for switching your focus to multifamily. Were there any other determining factors? Because I think with real estate investors, Obviously, the financial part of it is uh, a main factor, whether it's having enough equity or having enough or having being able to acquire debt um, to move their their investing career ahead. But um, what else other than the financing uh, attracted you to multifamily? So at that time, I did not know much about multifamily. Like a lot of people, I thought it was meant for the, for the big boys with the big money, you know, and not for people like me. And so to me, it was more or less like, you know, um, being caught up in a situation whereby, you know, I got to look for alternatives. So I did not know much about all the benefits that multifamily has. So it was a matter of just starting to research on, okay, I can get any better financing factor. So what basically stopped me from single family was purely financing factor. And then, of course, when I get into multifamily, I found all the other great benefits, you know, you know, like, for example, when I started looking into multifamily, finding that, uh, you no, know, all of a sudden you can get a non-recourse and I can get a bigger loan, you know, and uh, uh, all of a sudden uh, I can get a loan where they don't care how much I'm earning. And uh, it was just like, whoa, where have I been all years, you know? <laughs> I wish I knew, I knew this way back then. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how much... Uh, um, Boys, your apartment were going on at that time, but I, if I knew, you know, uh, uh, the multifamily financing, I probably would have definitely gone to multifamily way back then. Yeah, right. no doubt. Yeah, so the financing definitely the major thing because once you allot all your all your available mortgages, you're kind of tapped out, and now you have to figure out a different way of financing your next yes. property. So, what is your exactly. uh, Mm-hmm. What is your current investing strategy right now within multifamily? And I know you're in some other asset classes as well. Yeah. So with multifamily, uh, uh, I'm, I'm basically having two approaches. One is being a passive investor. So I'm looking for deals to be passive investor on. I have some IRA, IRA money to invest and also my own cash to invest. But I also do syndication. I'm more focusing on syndication. But of course, I know a lot of uh, great multifamily sponsors out there and uh you know whenever they have a good deal with the numbers working and look really great i would jump on it but uh, uh, uh the focus you know that i spent uh, uh, on my family multifamily investment time on is you know acquiring more deals and looking for more deals you know it takes a lot of time a lot of effort to you know 
look out for deals and get deals for each other. So what is your role within your company throughout the acquisition and asset management kind of stages of it? Are you finding the deals? Are you finding the equity? Are you performing asset management, project management after they're acquired? So um, I've been kind of a jack of all trades, to be honest, with the, with regard to multifamily syndication. Uh, uh, so basically playing all those roles, you know, uh, my first deal, I know, I, I know, for example, I knew the broker, worked with the broker, sourced the deal, uh, basically brought my partners into the deal and um, uh, we did the whole uh, acquisition process, raising money, doing everything. And now we're all doing the asset management, you know, basically weekly call with the property manager and doing everything. Uh, as time progress and definitely asset management, no doubt takes a lot of effort, you know, because it's, you know, initial thought like, oh, property management company is going to, you know, run the show and uh, we just, we're just going to check in, make sure that everything is <laughs> yeah. being done. But no, it's, asset management is a work by itself, you know, and uh, actually when you, when you work in the value add space like that we do, like the one we do, uh, you know, you cannot just come in and, you know, uh, acquire the property and say, oh, I'm going to asset manage and not do much. Every single day, there's something to be done uh, with, with the value add uh, asset. So uh, more and more, um, my approach going forward is to um, uh, work with partners whereby, because I'm, I'm not going to be able, the reality, I'm not going to be able to do 100% of the asset management um, if I want to acquire more property because these ones are taking more and more of my time. So it's a matter of, you know, working with partners, you know, and make sure that we structure such that, you know, I don't have the same, uh, uh, you know, one of the key partners, you know, one of the key partners kind of help, you know, mm. do a, a little bit of extra work with the asset management uh, with that regards. Yeah. No, I agree yes, totally. Yes, so that, mm -hmm, so that I can be able to spend more time, you know, acquiring properties. Yeah, everybody has their, their specialty mm -hmm. within the whole process. Yeah. And when you focus on that, it, uh, it benefits everybody because, um, you know, it's just everybody, some people are better at asset management, some are better at underwriting and speaking with brokers, um, some are better at raising the equity portion of the deal. So it's just mm -hmm. everybody has to play to... Uh, play to the strengths and also play to um, their available time. Obviously, if you're still working full time, it's something right. where, um, you know, asset management being very time consuming, um, mm -hmm. because pretty much you're managing the business. Um, you have, you know, a manager for your business, but you're actually mm -hmm. managing them. So it's a very, especially mm -hmm. when you have the projects going on, because none of these properties we're buying are really turnkey. These are all, like you said, value add properties. So right. Um, there's an ongoing project for possibly two years, you know, and this time right now, maybe more, but, no um, doubt. Mm -hmm. yes. So speaking about this time right now and what we're going through, how has your business changed because of COVID? Maybe like what your buying's changed, uh, how you're buying it, how you're managing it. So, um, you know, um, uh, as Warren Buffet always say, you know, when they run to the hills or, uh, you know, that's, uh, when time to get deals or when people are less greedy, that's when you can be greedy. So I believe anybody who's selling right now is a motivated seller. Let's face it. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for deals. I'm looking for deals right now. Uh, my underwriting has definitely changed to reflect the market. For example, all my, all my new um, deals, I am assuming zero income year one. And what that basically mm -hmm. zero income increase, zero income increase. So in other words, what I'm basically saying is I come in and I'm not going to raise a single penny on that deal. Can the numbers still work? If I'm, I'm you know, based on the T12, you take the T12, the way it's been operating the last 12 months, and assuming you're not able to increase on any of the income, can I still get the numbers to work? And to me, that's one of the way I'm checking if the property works. Of course, also still doing, you know, COVID-19 stress testing the deal and all that stuff. But the underwriting, my underwriting right now, assume none of that. And also typically on year two, I usually 
like for example, in a market like Dallas, I would assume three percent increase on year two. Right now, I'm seeing zero percent increase on year mm-hmm. two, or maybe in some case one percent or two percent, depending on the area. But basically, a uh, rent increase on year two is also extremely limited. Uh, uh, overall income on year two is solidly below uh, 10%, no more than, say, for example, 7% on year two. So I try to um, give myself room such that just in case it goes beyond year one, we're not fully recovered. I don't have expectations that not achievable on year two. No, I, I totally agree with that. We're doing the same thing. We're not writing any increases uh, for mm-hmm. the rest of 2020 for our underwriting. And then we're very, very uh, bearish, I guess you would say, on increases for 2021 until we've started mm-hmm. actually bringing some of the new apartments on and turning over and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. yeah, we're also getting longer interest only terms. It used to be just two years. Now we're going for four years interest only. Um, just gives us more mm-hmm. of a buffer when we're buying it. So how has managing your business changed during during all this, all your properties? Yeah, so we're definitely having to pay more close attention to uh, the, um, uh, the rental income. I mean, uh, I think everybody was completely freaking out back in March. <laughs> I was one of them too. Yeah. And uh, um, I think I don't think I freak as much as everybody, some people do, but you know, um, I was more or less on the positive side because mm-hmm. it will be when you have a sound. So one of the things we, we tested initially was stress testing our property, see how they would perform. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, we definitely put, you know, all the capex on hold for a little bit. I know one of our proper, we did not, cause when we stress tested it, uh, we could get up to 45% occupancy and still get the numbers to work. So we're like, okay. I mean, how will you get to 45% occupancy? So it, we will, we will just felt very, very confident that no reason to, you know, put any of the capex on hold. So we've been actually um, uh, continue the capex, and that property we acquired um, in February of this year. So we still have a lot of, we still have basically up all the initial capex. It's not like we are, you know, on the tail end of the deal whereby you know we have very little money left on the capex we still have a huge amount of capex so give us peace of mind that hey if anything changes down the line yeah we can reassess it but we can continue mm-hmm. or one or some other properties we basically decided like hey uh let's just put everything on hold a little bit to see where things are but uh we we are we we are basically uh this month we've decided to start restart some of those capex the interior upgrade uh, you know uh, uh, exterior renovations that we decided because we had no, we, we do not see any reason to hold back. Mm-hmm. All my properties have been doing great. You know, I know, for example, one of them, um, uh, we decided we just gonna, we were initially planning on implementing, um, uh, internet package on the property for $89 per door. And we kind of delayed it a little, but just the way things have been, that property has, constantly stayed at 98%. Wow. As a matter of fact, back in March, it was like 94%. And throughout all this time, it got 98%. I mean, there's no reason to delay. We can take the chance. So we're just going to, uh, next month, we're just going to proceed uh, with the implementation. Next month being July, that is. And, you know, because we're not just too concerned. Another property, this one is, for example, in Phoenix. I mean, we just, we still get a, a huge traffic of people coming in. And our rent have been low that we decided we're just going to start increasing rent. We're not going to wait anymore because, you know, uh, it's a matter of seeing what's on the ground, talking to the management company, seeing what they're seeing. And, um, you know, if there's a strong interest, the, the traffic's still there and people are still interested and you try one unit with a rent increase and nobody's saying no, then we're like, hey, let's have at it. Yeah. So I think my luck is, all the property we got is just we've been very fortunate to have them in locations, and I'm a strong believer in locations. Yeah. Um, uh, in trying to buy property at the right location in a, a growing area such that you can be able to easily, you know, weather the storm, like you know, in this case, COVID-19. Yeah, no, for sure. And we were reviewing some of our vacancies. 
we went from 94% economic occupancy, so people paying rent prior to COVID to on one of our properties to 98%. So you have a lot yeah. more people mm -hmm. staying in the properties. Obviously, we've paused a mm -hmm. lot of interior renovations on that one project, but we are still, like you said, we're still doing our exterior project renovations and stuff like that because that's all part of the mm -hmm. business plan. Um, and right. that doesn't even really affect the rent because no one's going to pay for, for them to have a not pay more for a non leaking roof, for example. But, right. um, <laughs> <laughs> what, um, so what do you see? We talked about your properties. What do you see as all for 12, to 24 months, let's say for multifamily? Um, what's your kind of your 30,000 foot view? So, uh, I think I am more bullish on the multifamily because I always feel like, um, I mean, and the industry data show is when you look at all the um, all the reports out there, right? I think there was a time was it real page or, or one of the one of the marketing uh, uh, one of the uh, industry reports out there. I was actually uh, looking at one of the Neil Bowers presentation, and it shows how different um, industry were going to you know be affected by COVID nineteen, and multifamily was on the bottom end. It was not the lowest, which kind of makes sense because I think the lowest was like shelf storage, you know, because in a way people lose their home, they still have to store their stuff somewhere, plus just operational point of view and, uh, you know, COVID-19, nobody's going to get, I mean, nobody's going to, but you have a less likely chance of getting COVID-19 at um, shelf storage, you know, <laughs> right. compared to getting it in an apartment. So um, I'm, I'm very bullish. Uh, I think this, this is going to be slow slow down which from a buyer point of view uh, uh, is really good i think there's gonna be some markets that are gonna feel it really bad uh, uh, the most obvious one of course is vegas and orlando and you know i think uh, this, this is the best time to look into those markets that you know that are effective overwhelmingly affected by this so markets are definitely not going to fail it. I was just looking at uh, um, uh, which report was that? Was it Forbes? So one of the reports showing, for example, you know, Salt Lake City and the Boise are some of the markets that are going to easily weather the storm just because of the way they are. You know, uh, uh, a lot of camp markets like Austin, for example, that you know are, have a lot of technology presence. You know. If there's one industry which is not going to fail a lot of this is technology because it's one job that a lot of people can easily do without coming to the office. I have been working from home since March because I'm in the IT. Even though my company is not an IT company, but with me being in the IT, I can easily go a lot long. I don't have to go to the office. I can stay in the home basically forever because yeah. all I need is just two things, my laptop and the internet, and, and that's it. <laughs> so it makes it very easy. So uh, uh, I think... So if you're wearing two hats, uh, if you're wearing a hat of a seller, yeah, uh, if you have a loan due, definitely, you know, you have a little bit to be, you might be expecting to give some kind of discount. If you're a buyer, I think there might be some discount. Some markets, I don't expect much discount at all. You know, Austin, Salt Lake City, for example, I don't expect much discount at all. But if you're in a certain market like Houston, you know, you, I would expect some kind of discount. Yeah. No, I agree. And I, I like how I think the same way we were talking about Nevada and Orlando and I'm based in Florida. We're really bullish in certain areas. We, we don't have any holdings in Orlando though, but um, mm -hmm. it's something where stuff that comes in from there from brokers, we review and we take a look at. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think you can just say uh, it's a no go in these areas. You always have to kind of see what people it's are deal looking by for. Deal. Yeah. It's all deal by mm -hmm. deal. Um, every area is a little different, um, different classes, uh, different in these areas with not as diversified employment, whether, you know, like Las Vegas and Orlando, for example, they're not the most uh, in, uh, employer diversified um, kind of uh, places. But um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, what we're looking for too is that if we're looking in, in I think places are going to be a much more stable where you have a diversified mm -hmm. workforce where you have, mm -hmm. um, and then you've had the consistent population growth as well, like the places even you mentioned there as well. I don't think you're going to see too much, too much change in that, uh, in, in those areas. But um, right. what mistakes do you, have you made in real estate investing and uh, what would you highlight to a new investor? 
Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, there's definitely always, um, you know, learning lessons. I've made both mistakes, both as a passive investor and also as um, um, a syndicator, you know. Uh, well, syndicate is more, not more or less my mistake. It's just, you know, a learning lesson. So I had a deal, you know, we were acquiring the deal. Um, this is my first deal. And um, uh, the deal had a chiller. And about two weeks before, you know, we closed the deal, the chiller caught fire. Uh, the seller was selling to us at a good price because they didn't want to deal with the chiller. And because it caught fire before uh, we closed the deal, they now had to replace it. And, uh, you know, of course, all of a sudden, a new chiller, the property value significantly goes high because of that. And um, they turn around, uh, they basically decide to walk away from uh, from the deal. So. You know, we spent like five months, the deal drag on for five months. The seller ended up walking away because, you know, they didn't want to sell to us. So uh, not, we lost money, but none of the passive investors lost money. You know, we refunded every single penny to our fa- passive investors. It's one of those ways you have to take as a, you know, syndicator is if the deal goes out, you know, you want to be, be in on this game you know, for the long run, priority number one is protecting investors money. So if the deal goes out, get them all the money back. So every, every single investor got their money back on that deal. Uh, me and my other partners, there were just two of us, you know, uh, as the lead sponsor on that deal. So we basically, you know, lost the soft cost. I mean, the seller returned the honest money to us because it already went hard. But because they're the one walking away from the deal, they return the honest money to us. But of course, as you know, there's always other soft costs like, you know, syndication attorney, you know, the appraisal and all those other soft costs, lender fees, all those are non-refundable. So we basically lost all those. And uh, from passive investment, my first passive investment deal, basically, you know, I saw all the, all the nice things about the property, but did not do good job at bearing the location. You know, I think uh, the syndicator might have been a little bit too aggressive with the assumption. And um, uh, as a result, you know, uh, uh, the property did not perform. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's one of the lessons I learned in, in my opinion. So on all my deals, for example, I'm going to tell my, my, uh, my, my passive, like, hey, we're going to get $100,000 in other income on this deal. That's what we're projecting. And this example, why? For example, we're going to install a washing dryer. We're going to do this and that. But on the underwriting, I'm not going to factor that in or a very small fraction of that in, you know, you know uh, into, into the underwriting. So that just so that, you know, if that end up not being achievable, actually, you know, there's a difference between an obvious thing versus something that you think can keep. I think the most common, for example, is wash and dry, right? Um, uh, it can easily show the numbers look really, really well if you had it into the underwriting. But the question is, what if you cannot achieve that, right? Because there's a good chance you might not, there's a good chance you not be able to achieve it. So what if you cannot, you cannot achieve it? Can the numbers to work? And as a syndicate, that's what, always what you want to show the investor is that hey, even though we're going to shoot for this, let's assume it's not achievable. Or let's only assume a very, very small fraction of it is achievable. So that, you know, if it ends up not being achievable, you don't end up being caught up in the middle. Right. Nice. Yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. Uh, it's definitely, you know, you have your estimates and then you also have um, kind of when you're speaking to your investor, you give them uh, the realistic view of something happens. You know what I mean? So, Mm -hmm. so how can, how can our listeners learn more about you and your business? Yes. So I have a website, Kindu Bay properties, um, uh, Kindu Bay, that's K E N D as in dog U Y. Um, no T N D U B as in boy, a Y properties. So Kindu Bay properties.com. Uh, they can easily come there and see some of the, you know, some of our assets. Not everything is listed there, but because uh, we are forever always adding more things uh, and it's being constantly updated, but they can always come and see, you know, some of our assets there. 
Uh, they can also reach out to me directly, you know, um, uh, through the website or call me on my cell phone, 818-635-4289. Uh, with any question, I'm always, you know, available anytime to talk to anybody. And they can also um, uh, connect with us on uh, Facebook. So just uh, Facebook slash Kindu Bay Properties. And then you can easily find us there. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll put all mm -hmm. those links into the, uh, the show notes. And I want to thank you yes. so much, Jack, for being on the show today. Thank you, too. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Yes, thanks. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Harborside Partners Incorporated exclusively.